Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Ascension Ed. I'm so glad to see a great turnout this morning. It's been fun having our, our different topics each week, and I think we've gotten a, a good start this year. Now, this morning, uh, we're blessed to have Annalise with us, who uh, I've I've enjoyed every conversation I've had with Emily. She she is uh, bright and engaging. She she's uh, in a job that uh, you know in, in the IT industry, but she really has a heart and passion for scriptures and teaching and Christian education and formation. And I, I watch as she lives that out. And so I'm excited to have her as a presenter today. Uh, we asked if she would present to us a bit on the the complexity and the 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 conversation around the church about LGBTQT and the, the labels and some of the associations. So it's it's kind of a hard conversation for some folks. Uh, I think Annalise will lead us well, but I also offered and she uh, she had asked if if there are questions as kind of clarifying maybe the church's position or, or those kinds of things, if I might jump in. So I'll, I'll let her facilitate the whole thing, but if she needs, she can turn to me and I'll jump back up here with you. Is that the awesome. <laughs> All right, so, so we'll, we'll begin right, we'll begin rightfully with a prayer and then I'll turn it over. So the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Lord, we give you thanks for this day and for the living of it. We give you thanks, Lord, for this church, this place that we're able to gather in your name and in your presence. We ask, Lord, that you unite us in your Holy Spirit, that you guide us towards your truth, that you offer us the, the wisdom uh, collective in this room, uh, that it, it might guide us towards a, a deeper sense of you and the love that you extend to us. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Elise. Okay. Thank you, Paul. So I want to start with a story. Once upon a time, there was a wise king and queen living in and they were good, they wrote fair laws, administered justice, protected the widow and the orphan, and had two great passions, their young son, who was growing up, and Rose Garden. And, and I, I don't mean just growing Mr. Lincoln, Peace, Chrysler Imperial, all the famous roses that people already know. No, they would create new roses and new colors Kind of amazing, but, but you know, the kingdom took a lot of their time. Well, the years passed, and their son grew in wisdom and grace. And one day they realized our son has grown to be a man, and he's ready to take on the kingdom, or else maybe we're ready to retire and do some rose gardening. So they call him in, and the king says, Grace, and his mother says, Son. We would like you to start and take over the kingdom and rule with justice and wisdom. But we're going to tell you the truth. You can't do it alone. You have to find a life partner who is going to support you when you're down, who is going to cheer you on when things get tough, and correct you when you go off the rails a little bit. You need that kind of person in your life to be able to rule a kingdom. So go out into the world and find that person. And off he went. And they continued on and they did a lot more gardening and they justified it to themselves in this way. When the prince comes back with his fiance, we're gonna let that person choose a rose, a new rose that will be named the prince's heart's desire. So they worked, and they worked, and they worked, and they worked. Until one day, a guard up on the castle walls saw a cloud of dust, and then the pennants flying, and the thunder of the hoofbeats, and saw the prince, and notified the king and queen, who were, of course, in the rose garden. And they said, oh, as soon as they get here, bring him down to the rose garden. So they come, and the king says to the prince, welcome home. And the queen says to the prince's fiance, welcome to your home. And we would like you to choose a rose that will signify the kind of love that you will bring. Okay? And so the happy couple starts wandering up 
and down the aisles, and they see beautiful, deep red roses that symbolize passion and desire. <coughs> and they come to purple roses, that regal color of purple, and they thought, that's it. Mm. No. And they come to pink, that pure, clean color <laughs> it brings a little excitement. <laughs> but that wasn't it either. <laughs> and they came to the yellow rose, but one of the countries the prince hadn't visited was Texas. <laughs> so they went on. And finally, the prince's fiance picks one rose and goes to the king and queen and says, this is the one. And they look at it and it's kind of shorter than the rest. Leaves are a little bit crinkled. It's not a pretty white, kind of streaked up. And so we don't understand. We don't understand. And the fiance says, breathe. Breathe deeply.
and she coined a term called hierarchy. Okay, so Greek lesson for the morning. What is curie? Uh, what is that about? Curie eleison, Christe eleison, Curie eleison. What is curie? What is that? The Lord, right? Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. So it's about Lord and Archie. You've heard of patriarchy, oligarchy, okay? Cat archie. Well, that, that exists only on Facebook. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's about power, the archons. That's got to be some game. That's got to be, I don't know if there's any game up here, but. So it's not, early feminism talked about patriarchy, the power of the potters, the, the fathers over women. And that was too simplistic. It's too binary. She's the free or that talks about curiarchy. So that can mean any kind of in any kind of power over. And it's not simple. It's just not men over women or able people over disabled people or whites over people of color or rich over poor. It's about all those different things. As a white woman who has an education, who has money, I mean, they do get salary in IT, I have power over other people, and I have to recognize that. And I may say, well, other people have power over me. Yes, that's where the complexity comes into. Um, I was recently in Romania, and I met with a woman who is a deputy minister, it's like the associate rector in a parish, and she said, women have full rights in this country. I said, okay. Is your bishop a woman? No, 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 the bishop's a man. Is your president a woman? No, 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 the president is a man. Is the president of your university a man? Yep, yeah, okay. So what are you saying? She says, well, you know, the second in command is often a woman. I said, okay. But what did it not include? There are no rights for LGBT people in Romania. <laughs> None. <laughs> and the Roma, you know, we often call them travelers here in Texas or Gypsy. gypsies. The Roma don't have rights. People don't have access to education the way that non Roma people do. So thinking in just one category isn't sufficient. So there's a kind of a, a there's kind of a challenge here of recognizing some of the labels that we use, and yet not confining ourselves to that to those labels. So we talk about L G B T Q I A a, and then it just was starting to get ridiculous, so people just say plus. <laughs> okay. So lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Again, Romania. I, I'm, I'm on the bus, and this guy says to me, you know, 40 years of service in the in the state of Georgia, and he says, I don't understand. If they want to be with women, why don't they just stay men? It's like, no, 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 there's a difference between sexual orientation, who you're attracted to, and sexual identity, who you believe you are, right? Just think for a moment. You wake up in the morning, and in your mind, you're a woman. But you wake up and you get out of bed, and that body is a man. How would you feel that something so basic in your identity is at odds with I think it's an area when, when we talk about compassion, this is a group that really, really needs our compassion. Because we all have felt that, right? Have you ever felt a stranger in a strange land? Maybe like you didn't fit into a crowd for some reason? You didn't fit in with an in-group? That's just a small taste of it, right? So LGBTQ, any guesses on what Q stands for? 
queer, and queer is not just a sexual orientation term, it's a political philosophy. And it came out of this being a, a slang, a swear, a put down, that people said, no, I'm taking it back. And you had political groups like Queer Nation and ACT UP say, yeah, there's something great about being queer. And you know what it is? It's the ability to question, to, to disrupt, to say the status quo is not okay. So one uh, view of what Q stands for is queer. And the other one is questioning. We have this sense that everyone has to fit into a box right now. I need to ask you right now to fit into a box. And as people have started to claim their sexual identity, their sexual orientation for themselves, some people are saying, no, questioning is my identity right now. That's where I am today. And it's OK. Um, the philosopher Martin Heidegger said that existence is about looking for authenticity. And if your authentic experience is today, I'm not sure where you fit. I'm questioning that's okay. The I, anyone? Intersex, right? So there are people who are not born and it's the baby comes out and you're like, oh yeah, that's a boy or that's a girl. There are people who have physical characteristics of both genders, whether that's internal or it's external. And that's become an issue in sports lately. If anyone watched the Olympics this summer, Caster Samaya is a South African woman who also has a Y chromosome. So there is some spectrum, right? And people talk about that a lot, being on a spectrum. You're not 100% this or 100% that, but somewhere on a spectrum. And intersex people play that. Now, AA has, again, multiple ones. Some people say this is asexual and aromantic. So people who are not interested in being in a sexual relationship, who are not interested in being in a romantic relationship, have claimed that title for themselves. But another way to look at the A, and I think this is really important, is to say allies. Because the LGBT community doesn't make it without strong allies throughout the churches, throughout society. And the plus is a symbol that there may be more. Um, one of my professors, when we were first talking about all this stuff, she says, look, my sexuality's not up there. I view myself as celibate. Now, that kind of, I had to think about that for a minute because growing up in the Roman Catholic Church where celibacy is a requirement for priesthood, that's not considered a sexuality, that's a discipline, right? But for her, it was a sexuality. And, and I've, come to, I've come to see that. But the more basic question is when someone tells you, this is my sexuality, this is who I am, maybe the most important lesson we can learn is to listen, to let people own the experience that they have, even if it doesn't fit into our own preconceived notions of, no, 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 <laughs> these are all the alphabet letters you get. <laughs> so maybe one good thing we can think about is is that plus. So could I? Yes, please. Uh, only this week, Miley Cyrus came out and said she was pansexual. Mm -hmm. And they, they were adding a P to the end in LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. um, and so well, there's a little one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good one. And I think it's kind of, so one of the things within the community is that B has not always been accepted. I mean, some people say, oh, no, no, you're just not willing to come out as lesbian or gay. You're hiding. No, I mean, you got to let people be that. But some people, and this is becoming more a trend in the younger community, is to say, yeah, I don't, I don't know. What if, it's like biracial, right? I mean, if you look at the census forms, a lot of times you see, you know, Caucasian, uh, Hispanic, African American, 
Asian Pacific Islander, and, and there's no category for biracial. So people have started saying, no, 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 uh, I am fully both, I want that category. Well, that works for some people, but what about somebody whose <coughs> mother is Native American and Hispanic, and their father is black and white? You're now up to four, right? Four, yes. So multiracial. And, and this is where I think pansexual is going through, or a, you know, a friend of mine told me he was omnisexual. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean by that? And he says, you know, women, men, Oh. <laughs> and, and before you start calling up the SPCA, I, just, uh, I don't think that's what it really means. Sometimes we are so literal, right? It's about saying, I don't want to be locked into categories. Cats are just for the internet, people. Not for anything else. So I, I think it's about breaking down categories and allowing people to say, at this point in my life, this is where I am. At this point in my life, this is where I am. And speaking about that experience. So kind of my last point is how does that work within the church, right? Because I really believe that there is a huge gift here. That this kind of ability to have more complex more nuanced discussions is a gift for the church and for the LGBT community. It's, it's the ability to say, I have a little bit of insight into issues of poverty, that people who are poor, no matter what their color or their religion or their race is, are sometimes oppressed or are sometimes not allowed to come in Part, right? I think that the LGBT community, with its experiences of that, has given to share to the community, to the church community to say it's about inclusion and it's not about inviting people in. You over there, <laughs> you come on in, we have something great to share. It's about recognizing the fact that we are here already. We are Christian. We are somewhere on this spectrum. We may identify as allies or heterosexual or L or B or Q or P. And that there is conversation to be had. So that's my, my spiel. What do you all have to, to say? What are your questions and thoughts about where we are in the church today? And I am sorry you're having to pull that from. Would you get to take a pull of this up? <laughs> so do you see them being more accepted in church now? <coughs> um, yeah, I think they're... Can they're you repeat her question? I can. Oh, sorry. Are LGBT persons more accepted than mm. before? Uh, yes. Yes. It, it's a, but it's a work in progress, right? So it was founded... Integrity is a group uh, in the Episcopal Church that was founded in 1974 by a gentleman uh, named Louis Crew in Georgia. And so 1974, that's just over 40 years ago, right? And, and the church has made these steps. It has done things like ordained people. It, it started out with saying, um, I have a few you know, the official prohibition of discrimination was 76. <coughs> Gene Robinson, the uh, openly gay bishop, uh, ordination was a huge, uh, huge step forward in 2003. But I would include in that uh, something I'm very proud of. In January 2016, the Anglican Communion said that uh, the Episcopal Church could no longer represent the Anglican Communion in interfaith bodies and could not vote. And I think that that's a wonderful thing. Why? Because where did you find Jesus? You found Jesus a lot of times out on the margins. 
going off to the desert, standing with the lepers. Nobody else is coming close. And the lepers are shouting, unclean, unclean. People are running away. And Jesus is with them. That's where I think the church needs to be. Not that if the LGBT community are lepers, please don't make that <laughs> But it's standing out there with people. And I think that that's important because it means it's not just you know, one pastor over here in San Francisco, one bishop over here in LA, one community over here in New York City, that it, that it starts to be all of us. And I think that's a great thing. So progress, yes, more to come. One of the things, um, that Integrity has is a program called Believe Out Loud. And that's for parishes who want to be explicitly named as open and affirming. So you can Google it, right? Because I mean, that's that's how we do our spiritual path sometimes, right? We look for some of the people. So there's more to come. John, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, it belongs to a slightly earlier phase of discussion. But there's a, um, she died recently, he himself sexually. He wrote a book about sexualities and the conclusion she finally came to after both introspection and studying historical sources and talking with other people was the question, how many different sexualities are there? The answer is, as many as there are people. And once you grasp that, you realize that yes, we've come a very long way, and we are all still very much works on this. And to link that back into the church, just flip one of Jesus' sayings. I always like to flip sayings as you heard before in these meetings. Behold, I stand behind the door and wait for you to knock. No. That's not what he said, and that's not what we should ourselves be doing. Could, could everyone hear what? Yeah, okay. 
like even like for, like just even like you know like we all we, we do stuff that like <laughs> that like we make mistakes we're human and like like not talking about LGBT stuff but like just like you just just being human is yeah. like the the excluding people because they're different from us is right. like probably one of the least Christian things that like I can think of. Is it's you know because like you said Jesus goes out and actively searches out the people who are normally excluded and you know it's the those are the people who inherit the kingdom of God right. The, yep. Yeah. You, you want to say? Yeah, I was just gonna say some of my friends um, went to like a a private like really small um, like uh, Christian school, and when they um, enrolled the engine, they had to sign like yeah. an agreement, yeah. agreeing to all of their beliefs, and it just kind of it's like a very very negative environment, and, like I don't know, you see, like the kids like judge each other. And, This is where I mentioned believe out loud communities. Uh, I mean, there's two ways, really. One is if you know an individual, right. you can always invite that yeah. individual right. to church, right? right. The best way. It is the best way, and we have, a, we have an experienced reader. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the danger with that is the entire world would hear when Perry greets you <laughs> and then, <laughs> Loving birth. 
versus the Commonwealth of Virginia was a law case that went to the Supreme Court because it was against the law for interracial couples to marry in the state of Virginia. I mean, 19, sorry, in the year of 1990, <coughs> it was still illegal in South Carolina. Oh, no. <coughs> well, she wouldn't tell me these things, Joe. <laughs> which allowed uh, gay people to marry in all 50 states. One thing is the laws, and we need to have laws that protect people. But the other thing is the culture. What kind of person doesn't celebrate love where it's found? So I think that's where few of us are at the level in, in politics that we have the ability to change laws. All of us, from the oldest in the room to the youngest in the room, have the ability to change culture, to invite someone to church, to sit next to them at lunch. And so I think uh, that is an important thing. And I'm, I, I have an action item <laughs> to you know, maybe address that one. And I, I don't know if you want to address this lady. I'm sorry, I don't know any Tanya? Tanya. Talia, Talia, sorry. You had a comment too, but maybe could I just let uh, Father Paul address that question? Recap it for me. About whether there would be a group here in the church, or do you see a need for that? Or well, I mean, certainly there's always options for groups to form. I mean, it, it often they come out of things like this where people first express an interest. So, I mean, it's, I mean, we could we could run an article or something where we can try to gauge interest a little bit further and determine what what shape that might take to. Um, and we, we work to be welcoming and uh, hospitable. I mean, I think a number of people noted the, the article about uh, marriage equality that went out in the Ad Ascension recently. That, I mean, that touches one particular issue. I mean, so again, I mean, it, the, the church, like you say, it's a work in progress. And I mean, certainly even just, I mean, we, there's, there's Christendom, where we have many churches with very different views, and then we have the Episcopal Church, or our own framework. I'm, I'm grateful that the Episcopal Church, as Annalise had referenced, made an affirmation of uh, the diversity of people in 1976. Now, acknowledging them as, as individuals is one step in that chain, and then, uh, you know, for years, somebody who fell into a category or a label may have had particular difficulty progressing in an ordination process or uh, in, in leadership positions. And I think we've made progress there. Uh, now when we move towards uh, full incorporation into the sacraments, it's another step yet. I mean, so, so marriage is, is one of those steps. And I think, I mean, I really think it's been an issue in humanity for a very, 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 very long time, like as long as humans have walked the earth long. I think for generation after generation after generation, it was pushed to the back or ignored because there were more pressing issues. You know, people were at war with each other. They were worried about food or shelter or health care or well-being. And it's now maybe for the first time in the course of human history that we actually have the wherewithal, where the, the basic human needs are met to such a degree that we're actually having real conversations about it. Progress. And, and it is challenging because we have lots of generations behind us of momentum to kind of prevent that progress. So these conversations I think are helpful. Uh, you know, certainly I'm willing to engage the idea of a, a group that might continue that work or consider what that means for us as a church. Is that it uh, was probably a very long, long winded preacher answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in hindsight, sorry. No, thank you. <laughs> tell, tell you? The context I thought mattered. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> so, um, I read the letter on Facebook and it made me upset for the member, but then it also made me just really sad for the church and the people who think that way. And partially that's because of the, the winding road that led me here. I, I grew up. Southern Baptist, I remember being told in my fourth grade Sunday school class that it was against the Bible for a black person and a white person to get married, so 
those of you feeling really sad about the state of racial affairs, like 1994, that's what we were told. And I remember growing up later and reading the Bible and being like, wait, that's not in there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>
hopefully uh, we'll see many of you back as uh, Deacon Soup presents next week. So the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for the fullness of your creation. And we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather and discuss this so openly, Lord. We ask that as we leave here that uh, you continue to open our hearts and our minds to the, the, the world around us. That you continue to uh, direct us to those who might be in need, particularly those who may be uh, uh, pushed aside from another a community that uh, we might provide uh, the, the welcomeness and love that we receive from you in the gospel, that we receive from you in our prayers, that we receive from you in the sacraments of this church, that uh, you might be known to all the world for your love, your grace, and your mercy. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.